name is Jochen Reiner. I'm the Chief Medical Officer at Hawthorne Effect, and we want to talk today with Dr. David Cohn about clinical research. Dr. Cohn is an interventional cardiologist and world-renowned expert in health economics and outcomes research. He has published more than 500 scientific articles, serves on the editorial board of various journals, and has been writing for the New England Journal of Medicine, Watch Cardiology, since 2018. David, it's a great pleasure and honor talking to you today. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for inviting me. Throughout your career, you have been a thought leader in clinical research. What does clinical research mean to you? It's a great question. Uh, clinical research is ultimately how we figure out how to practice medicine in 2022 and uh, you know, for many centuries to come is, it, uh, is my guess. Uh, it's how we generate the evidence about what works, uh, what doesn't work, in which patients, um, how best to perform various procedures. Uh, are these medications or devices or treatments uh, worthwhile or cost-effective? All of these things uh, come to us from clinical research. So it is really fundamental to the, uh, uh, to the work that we do as uh, physicians and healthcare providers to, uh, to help our patients. Yeah, and as it is so important, um, what are today's challenges in conducting clinical research? The biggest challenge that we have is that many things work well already. Uh, it's very easy to demonstrate that something is beneficial um, when nothing works. Then you only need a few patients uh, to show that. When penicillin was invented, uh, it didn't take very long to figure out that it was good at you know curing bacterial infections. But now especially in the field that I'm in, cardiology, we have many effective therapies. Uh, we've come a very long way in the last 50 years. And what that means is that the advances that we make are very often incremental. They are smaller than you know, perhaps in the past. And that, in order to detect those, uh, we need larger and larger clinical trials because that's how we can establish whether you know, a small benefit is still important to our patients to uh, keep the field advancing, keep, their, keep our care advancing. And that adds you know, a, a tremendous amount of expense uh, to the clinical trial enterprise, takes time, uh, which you know, nobody has, the patients nor the, uh, uh, the, the people who are developing these therapies. So all of these things uh, really contribute to the biggest challenge we have uh, in our clinical trials, which is the, the sheer size and complexity of many of them. Yeah, that's a great point, uh, David. And, and given the increased sample size of today's trials, how can we ensure still timely enrollment of a diverse patient population? So that is something which has really be, begun to be appreciated in the last uh, decade or so, and is an area that many people, including myself, are really uh, focusing on and trying to drive, for, drive forward. We realize that you know, if you look at especially cardiovascular disease, for example, um, our treatments are very often tested on a relatively homogeneous population. Uh, they tend to be men more than women, Caucasian more than minorities uh, uh, in various countries, um, more, it, often um, more uh, socioeconomically advantaged individuals. All of those things are they're understandable given our healthcare system, but they're not ideal from the standpoint of how we develop evidence because we need to know if our treatments work in everybody. Uh, and if they don't, why they don't. And in order to figure that out, we need to enroll a really broad group of patients in our clinical trials. We need to increase the number of women. We need to increase the number of minorities. Uh, we need to reach out to people of different ethnicities. All of these things are critical to our studies these days. And really the way um, the, to do that, that we are beginning to appreciate is with studies that really take the study to the patient. Um, I think that really is um, a lot of the message. I've been involved in several uh, clinical trials recently um, where they have been virtual clinical trials. The, the COVID pandemic that we've been in for the last couple of years has really uh, raised the bar uh, on this because patients don't necessarily want to come in the hospital for their follow-up uh, uh, for these studies. Uh, it's you know it's scary, uh, uh, difficult for them. The interactions are difficult. And so the extent that we can do these using technology 
um, in, you know, in many cases can lead to a much more diverse patient population. Uh, we're involved, as you know, uh, with a study with Hawthorne Effect right now uh, that is really trying to do this uh, perhaps as ambitiously as any that I've ever done, where we are trying to enroll a very large group of patients across the entire United States. Uh, but in order to ensure that we get the minorities and to get the age distribution and to get um, all of the different uh, uh, stakeholders and all of the different uh, diversity that we that we want, uh, we are um, partnering with the Hawthorne Effect to bring the clinical trial to the patient, right, to their home. Uh, and I think that is going to turn out to be a really remarkable advance uh, and is going to change in many ways uh, the, way, the way we do a lot of clinical trials from here, here going forward. So let's double click for a moment on the study follow-up. Trials have failed in the past due to incomplete data and poor data quality. What are the main reasons and today's strategies to ensure pristine study data? Uh, that, that is you know, no question about that. It goes hand in hand with the issue we talked about before about the larger sample sizes. And if you need a large sample size, uh, that means that you need very precise, very well measured and very complete data uh, in order to keep that sample size. It doesn't matter if you enroll 10,000 patients in your study, if you only follow 5,000 of them. Uh, that, you know, so we need to, every single patient that we enroll, we need to keep in the study. This is particularly true when we're looking at certain things like patient reported outcomes. We can assess you know, mortality retrospectively. We can, you know, if, if we are missing some patients, we can, you know, we can use various uh, public records and things like that to find out uh, you know, if the patients have died. Um, but if we want to assess things that matter, you know, in addition to mortality to our patients, like quality of life, uh, those can't be gotten retrospectively. You have to get them at the time when the patient is, uh, you know, in the study. Uh, you can't ask them, what, do you remember what your quality of life was three years ago? They're not going to remember that. Uh, and so for, the, for those sorts of things, we have to have very, very complete uh, follow-up rates. And again, this idea of really going to the patient, of bringing them into the study, and of having them really be engaged participants uh, in the study uh, uh, through you know, a variety of different techniques, I think is one of the best ways that we can uh, enhance the completeness and the quality of the data we collect. Again, I have a, a particular example in mind that I've you know, recently involved, been involved in with some of my colleagues where we used um, smartphones to assess quality of life at various time points from our, uh, our patients. And the response rates were remarkable. I've never seen response rates as high as we got in these uh, studies that used smartphones uh, that all the patients had in order to assess the quality of life at multiple time points. And so that really was a, a lesson to me. I think, again, bringing the trials uh, to the patients where they are conveniently in their lives um, is going to really enhance the quality and completeness of the data that we, that we uh, uh, derive from these trials. Real-world evidence can help to understand the safety and performance of medical innovations outside highly standardized clinical trials. We are at Hawthorne, in fact, strongly believe in the concept of patient follow-up for life. What are your thoughts, David, on real-world evidence, and what are today's limitations, and how can we overcome these? That's a really important point. Uh, and we have used real world evidence in a variety of ways for, for many, many years, but there really are two main areas <clears throat> where, where it comes into play uh, in the clinical research enterprise. One is monitoring for um, safety. Uh, when we test new devices or drugs, we often do that in uh, studies of hundreds or a few thousand patients. Uh, but then when they get rolled out and approved, uh, they end up being used in tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, even potentially millions of patients. Uh, and it's important to be able to monitor uh, those early uses uh, for any unusual signals of safety that might arise. Uh, and that's one use of, you know, of real world evidence. Uh, in the United States today, we have a number of uh, treatment registries that we often use to track those uh, sorts of unusual events. And they are a very important part of our surveillance system. Uh, and the FDA uh, in particular pays a lot of attention to that, uh, uh, to that information. The other place where real world evidence really comes into play uh, is actually in the clinical trials. Uh, it is cumbersome and expensive to do the very large scale trials that we often uh, need to do these days as we've discussed already. Uh, and one way to lower the cost and the burden 
uh, to patients, to investigators, to companies uh, that want to conduct these large uh, types of studies is to embed the clinical trials within the healthcare system. So still taking advantage of randomization to generate the high quality of treatment comparisons that we want in order to uh, really generate medical evidence, but then to use data that we can get from the healthcare system, from medical claims, uh, from national healthcare systems in order to generate the outcomes data to track the patients over time uh, to understand what is happening. Uh, there have been some very particular examples in the area of cardiology, uh, in particular in the uh, Scandinavian countries that have wonderful nationalized healthcare systems and data uh, sources. Uh, and increasingly, there is interest in doing this more in the United States and in other countries again, to, gener to use the real world systems that we have to generate data that is most applicable to our patients, but to do this in an efficient way, in a very timely way, uh, so that we can generate high quality randomized trial evidence, um, but limit the burden to our patients uh, and to, uh, frankly, the funders uh, for doing these studies. So David, we are already at the end of this discussion. What are the main points this audience could take away as we evolve the clinical research landscape? I think the most the, the main messages are that our trials are getting more complex, uh, larger, sometimes longer. Uh, uh, for those trials, we really need to engage the patients. We really want to start increasing our emphasis on, on diversity of patients who are enrolled in our studies to understand all of those aspects. And for that, I think there's nothing better than bringing these studies to the patients where they are, in their homes, in their lives, uh, and I'm hopeful that with doing that, we will again be able to generate, continue to generate very high quality evidence, but evidence that is more generalizable than some of the uh, uh, studies that we've done in the past. Thank you, David. It was a pleasure talking with you today. It's been my pleasure. Thanks for having me on.